I said that property for 20 years was the darling investment of the Chinese consumer. It actually makes up 70% of their wealth. Property prices only went up with very few little ditches, glitches in the, in the matrix. And, and otherwise, property was just one big success story for a Chinese investor for 20 years. And now they have this little thing called gold market where, you know, they buy about two, three hundred billion a year. And actually, if the masses really start to learn more and more about it, and the gold exchange, the Shanghai gold exchange has been set up to make it convenient for you and me to understand how you do it. And it's easy and there is an app and there is this and there is that. So it's really made to to attract a, a new retail and new clients and, and new professionals and so on. And, and if they continue their growth path, I'm getting very optimistic on gold. Hello and welcome to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, the CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this conversation. Really looking forward to this one because it's with a first time guest here on the channel. He's Swiss, so don't complain. We will be doing this in English. A German and a Swiss guy will be doing the interview in English. No complaints in the comments, please, below. But I'm really looking forward to it. It took some convincing to get him on, but it's Alexander Steil. He's the CEO, CIO, founder chairman over at the Burggraben Holding, meaning Moat Holding AG out in Switzerland. And I'm really looking forward to get his perspective. We, we had a chat earlier or late, uh, late last week where we sort of synchronized topics a little bit. And uh, we've decided to focus mostly on commodities, but with a German or sorry, European perspective. We're going to look at the, the energy transition in the EU. How is this impacting uh, the commodity prices? But we're also going to take a look at China supply and demand over there as well, because it affects copper and gold simultaneously. Really looking forward to the the next 30 40 minutes here with my guest but before i switch over to my guest you know the spiel hit that subscribe and like button it tremendously helps us out reach a wider audience we really appreciate it now without much further ado hashtag really great pleasure to have you on thank you so much for joining me thank you for having me yeah, let, let's start with a bit of an introduction, because you mentioned to me last week, you don't do too many interviews. So maybe we'll need to, you know, frame uh, the audience's mind a little bit. Like, who is Alexander Stahel and what do you do at Burggraben Holding? Yeah, look, uh, Burggraben Holding is, is my holding company. Um, having said that, we also have clients, which we manage in a managed account. And uh, all we do is long, short equity. Having said that, it's mostly long rather than short, but short can happen too. And... Uh, you know, we try over the years, I build a, what, what Buffett calls a circle of competence. And um, I would say mine is, you know, other than I call, call it the old economy, it's in, in, in commodities. And so over time, I, I hope we have um, created um, more relevant data than most. And um, we try to track those in real time. So we uh, actually invest quite a bit in our data services and um, I think over time we also uh, managed to to read some of these cycles maybe a little better than average, and um, I would say that the focus there is you know other than energy, so oil, gas, and um, and coal, it, it's um, uh, you know the base metals and and also the precious metals. But again, it's not we're not exclusive on, on these things. But um, uh, the, it, over time we figured that. Many, many uh, quality companies are just too expensive for us. And so we, we focus on, on something that gives a cycle. Now, let's uh, explain what Burggraben means as well. In, in German, it's Burggraben. In English, it's Moat. Of course, it's the circle that protects the castle. But uh, let, let's explain that a little bit. And how does that sort of fit your investment profile? Well, if, you know, in a, I'm not a trader. It's not my nature. Um, I like to think about... I think about uh, um, my investment ideas deeply, carefully, long term. Over time, I, you know, you, uh, we all adapt to uh, what works and what doesn't. But um, my style is to um, what I call go the extra mile and really look at, at companies carefully. And the ideal target is a company that has an extraordinary competitive advantage and they are very hard to um, create there is a professor in uh, in new york at columbia his name is uh, bruce greenwald and uh, he wrote a fantastic book competition demystified i recommend everyone to read it and uh, if you read that book you you really have it as as nicely structured as you can you know it it should be kind of 
instead of people going to Harvard or St. Gallen or any of these universities, that book would actually do the trick um, if you want to go in investing. And once you study that carefully, you will just know that WD40s, um, uh, you know, are created very rarely, Coca-Colas and whatever their names. And um, uh, most companies just don't have a lasting competitive advantage. And um, I would argue uh, while Apple has one now, we'll have to see whether it has one in 10 years. I mean, the, these things come and go. And so on that basis, um, you know, ideally you'll find the company early on in the cycle that is creating a mode and that, you know, makes that mode, that competitive advantage bigger and bigger and bigger. Having said that, um, it's... Um, um, you know, the, the financialization of markets also matters. And it seemed to us, when I created Book Garden in 2014, it seemed to me that everyone was expensive. I was clearly wrong then because everything got more, ex more expensive than high quality. But that's why we focus more on, 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 on cyclical things where we think we can read the cycle hopefully a little better. And so that creates an opportunity on the long and the short side. But ideally, you would, would find Coca-Cola in 1980 and don't do nothing. For 40 years, that that would be the smart way to invest in mining. Question question now is, and maybe that's also the segue to our topic of discussion for today, but how do commodities fit into that? Like, how do you press that? And you, you said you look at energy, of course, but also the base metals and precious metals. So, so how does that fit in? Do you look at individual companies in that uh, in that space or like do you look at the commodity as a whole? My background um, was investment banking and was, um, you know, uh, operational activities where I bought myself into smaller companies and uh, in most cases there were turnarounds and also in private equity. And so what I like to say is I lived, I, I learned to live with my mistakes uh, and, and fix them. And so um, what that means is that um, I have a fundamental approach clearly. I, I really know how to look at companies fundamentally, how to dissect the models, what, what is their advantage, disadvantage, and I think I do that faster probably than, 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 than many. Now, I am 53. <laughs> I'm doing it for a long time. Um, where do commodities come in? Um, so, again, uh, when you look at an oil company and you don't understand oil, you might as well not look at the oil company. It's, it's, it's almost a waste of your time because... The commodity cycle will uh, decide a lot about what ExxonMobil uh, share price is going to do. That's just a fact of life. Now, if you look at the smaller companies, uh, you know, a few years back, we were the major shareholder in a company called Petrotal, a, uh, you know, young upcoming producer in Peru. And we looked at that very carefully. You want to understand a lot of more things than just the... Uh, um, the oil price, right? You want to understand the reservoir. So we bring it, we brought in reservoir engineers to, to help us look at that because we aren't. Um, and then we, you know, we went to the different authorities in Peru to understand whether they will, will make this adventure a nightmare or, or, or are supportive. And um, we obviously looked at all the details of the company, including management. And we even took a little bit of an activist approach in some cases where we weren't very happy with the capital allocation. Or the cost. So, um, so, so we're definitely more Buffets than we are day traders. And um, at the same time, we, um, you know, you over time, and as you do these things, you, you become hopefully better in them, and then you you focus more on these things because, at the end of the look, I fi I find it interesting to focus on things where I have five hundred or thousand companies doing the same, so I can find alpha. Um, um, to look at uranium is at the limit, right? There aren't that many companies left that where you can pick and so on. So you might as well just pick the two or three largest. And uh, if you believe in, in, in uranium, which I do, by the way, um, um, but, but in oil, you can really uh, pick, you know, 1000 different companies and, and, uh, and, and, and have um, winners against the trend. So at the moment, for instance, we're invested in Gold Keystone which is kind of a, a, what I call a free option on, on, on uh, the exports coming back from Kurdistan into, into the Turkish pipe or terminal. And, um, you know, the, in the last three months, the, 
company went from 100 to 150 while oil actually i wouldn't want to be at the moment invested or exposed to oil so what i'm trying to say is there are special situations where 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 it can still make sense to belong the equity and perhaps even short the commodity since, since you opened that can of worms uh, alexander just like j just a quick follow -up. why don't you want to be in oil and gas and then we can put a bow around that topic because we need to talk base metals and uh, precious metals of course but since you since you mentioned it yeah, I got, got a bit of a uh, of criticism on Twitter um, when I, you know, in twenty uh, in Ju in June twenty twenty two, I more or less said, "Look, this is uh, this is uh, for the moment as good as it gets in the oil cycle." And then, you know, at that point, obviously, I had a lot of oil followers because I was very long uh, before that, and um, and um, and you know, in Twitter, sometimes people are too focused on one topic and then uh, it becomes personal rather than just um, you know a factual uh, situation of a, of a commodity anyway I, I announced very publicly that I sell out of petrochemical and that I think the oil cycle has peaked that has proven right and um, we even got paid on some of those ideas having said that um, I've uh, you know I would say now by six months or, or even nine months, I say that uh, oil, I think, is range bound. You know, probably uh, at 70, it's uh, uh, it's risky to be short oil. And at 90, it's certainly very risky to be long oil. And in between, you have to understand exactly the positioning short term of the specs and, uh, you know, different constellations on OPEC or, or on, the, on the US shale or the supply side or the demand side. In general, I would argue that the demand side is weakening, and that's never a good thing to belong a commodity when demand side is weakening. At the same time, the supply side in general continues to surprise on the upside, and I think that's what most bulls of the last, call it two years, have missed. Now, that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean they weren't, uh, you know, that, that they got hurt because equities were actually okay performing. I mean, they didn't make, probably make money, but they didn't, didn't lose money in, in, in since June 22. But, um, you know, I still think it's it's just a, at this stage, um, uh, the supply side is, is just fine. Uh, OPEC is actually um, has, has record or OPEC plus has record uh, spare capacity which is never a good thing. So the more spare capacity there is, the, the, the more bearish it is actually for oil, obviously, or the less, the more spare capacity gets used, the more uh, bullish it becomes for oil. So that's that constellation. If you look at the latest data on the, uh, again, on the demand side in the US, that's, um, you know, we haven't seen diesel as weak um, in, in years. I mean, it, uh, the US diesel is as weak as, um, as it was in COVID. So think about that. That's like very weak. And, um, and then Asia is also not particularly strong or in pockets weak. And then China is always a little special to understand. Hopefully we can explain more about China when we get to copper. I think uh, there is a lot to be said that people misunderstand or misread about China. And I, I think we, we've done a lot of work on China to, 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 to get to, to, to look behind the kimono. Okay, so that's all. No, fantastic. Let's put a bow around that. That was a bit off topic. We had discussed that before, but I find it interesting because I look at it as well. I look at the geopolitical shocks that are happening in the oil space, and yet the oil price doesn't really move. So appreciate yeah, the perspective. Yeah, that's there. Quite a really good, good comment to make. I mean, if, if there is so much geopolitical risk, you always have to ask why, why is oil not, not moving more. And there were times when, um, you know, about four years ago when, when, when they attacked um key saudi um producing centers um and um and oil didn't react so that's always a sign that there is plenty of oil around and i think those who argue uh, the other way around i i just don't see the consistency i just don't see it and if people argue you know shale is about to collapse i just don't see it in the data at all um and we have very good um i have to say we have very good um, um real-time data on shale too now it's it, it's really coherent. We're consistent with that. Do what Doomberg said on our channel a, a while ago as well. The U.S. is almost self-sufficient. Most of the oil trading happens, of course, in the U.S. and U.S. dollars. So it makes sense why the oil price isn't moving, despite the turmoil in the Middle East. It, it makes sense, right? 
No, fantastic. Um, you, you brought up China, and we need to talk about maybe globally con the global economy. And uh, you, you mentioned demand weakening, and uh, I'm taking that as a sign of global recession. So I'm curious. Um, let, let, let's throw copper in there and Dr. Copper and the price action we've seen the last few weeks here in, in, in the copper price. Um, based on your Twitter feed, I know you've been negative on copper, and uh, you've told people to avoid copper, and uh, the price action is proving you right, because we're now trading at 450, we're down almost 60, eh, 60 cents a pound again. So I'm curious, like, is, is there a, a correlation between global economy, copper and oil prices? So the big one is oil. Um, if, you, if, if you're in macro and you don't understand oil, it, it's going to be very hard for you, um, I think, to, to, to make the right call. So I think oil is, is just, for another 30 years, uh, the key commodity to understand, it's, you know, 10 times bigger than, than copper. And, you know, yes, there is this uh, major theme about the gain shift. And we have what we call the fit for 55 rows in Europe, which are the you know, the only proper laws at the moment legislated uh, throughout the world, right? Uh, many signatures are for the Paris Agreement, but not many uh, legislation for, for what, that, what it actually means. And um, now if you would assume, if we would fast forward, say, 30 years, and uh, we would argue, okay, now we have um, half the global fleet, of whatever transports, whatever, so passenger cars, trucks, whatever, um, is now electrified. Then I would say, okay, now let's pay uh, very close attention to to the price of copper because substitution becomes more difficult. But um, right now, it's just that the fleet is very small still, growing very fast. But the key center where it's going is China and not not Europe and not the US at all. And then the rest of the world, it's irrelevant. It's a hobby. Um, and, and, and so um, I think people have to be um, careful to get too excited or to get ahead of the, of the curve when it comes to this green shift. Now, um, I was actually taking a very close look in 2019 when, when, when it started to get real and I started to realize, wow, the, the European Union is actually making these laws. And so we were actually uh, early on saying, wow, this, this copper setup gets interesting because the supplies, we, I don't know how many out there, there are there out, out there, but what we did here is we modeled out each copper mine there is. And believe me, it wasn't easy. It took us weeks and weeks of hard work. So we, you know, we tracked that each little mine in, in Russia and even in Iran and wherever we can so that we at least understand the supply side because the demand side is even harder to understand. And um, which, by the way, is easier in oil, for instance, or in, in natural gas for Europe. Uh, no, we have fantastic real-time data, but, but the copper is, is much, much more difficult. So... On the supply side, I can confirm it's very hard um, to, to, to move the needle. In fact, I would argue come 27, 28 is when the, when the supply side uh, starts to, to move downwards, not upwards. Okay, so now the problem with commodities is now it's 24, not 27. And from here to there, a lot of things can happen. A lot of news comes in, a lot of little things matter more and commodities tend to price in the present and, and don't discount the future. Equities look at the future and discount a lot of things into the present. Commodities trade in the here and now. And, um, and so you cannot get ahead of the curve. Now, as for this summer, um, um, copper suddenly got into this narrative because, uh, you know, there was a bit of Destocking in in Comex in the US and um, and actually in China the, the the contrary happened. The thing is just China uses fifty percent of copper, so we don't consume copper. We use copper. It's important. People always con misuse these words. Um, and um, and the rest of the world uh, uses the rest, but but the US is by now is just very small for copper use. It's almost uh, you know irrelevant. Sorry for for my American friends and. It's also not important, it's just the way it is. Um, and, um, and yet the, uh, the American capital market is by far the largest. You know, the, the, the big hedge funds are, are in the US and, and within London. 
And so they can form opinions, they can make prices, and they can create uh, positionings that, that matter for prices. And so in my view, um, you know, the good trading houses all miss that, call it price spike for, for about three to four months. In fact, I know of two Swiss one here based, as you know, they, they move most of the metals as they move mo most of the oil, what is here in Zug or, or in Geneva. And I know for a fact they missed it because they, you know, <laughs> they weren't, weren't uh, concerned about, at all about <laughs> copper, copper shortages. And um, and so you see how narratives can actually um, uh, become powerful. And my my observation is just that the narratives follow the price action. So if for whatever reason something gets priced up, then the narrative forms and it gets stronger and stronger. And then if that goes on for three months, at the end of the you know, when copper is at 500, um, everyone is convinced that uh, we run out of copper tomorrow and we're never going to have a mine and supplies are dis disrupted and green shift is huge and China is actually uh, doing okay and, you know, and we just, you know, the price needs to double from here. And and that's just the classic trap where when you then start to do the commodity work and look at, okay, what's going on in, in copper in, in, in real time? You start to understand that the pricing in China actually was was cheaper than internationally. So there was a arbitrage opening for 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 Chinese copper to be sold to LME uh, to London or even to Comics from LME. And um, and when you have these kind of arbitrages in in commodities, you can absolutely be sure that some of the traders or even individuals will 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 follow them. Uh, and, and therefore it, it cannot last. And, and in, I explained, I would say, you know, starting mid May that, that, that this phenomenon is, is, is real. And I said, look, from here, uh, it just doesn't make sense. Don't, don't, don't fall full to this uh, narrative. And then I sent out one tweet, I sent two tweets, uh, you know, one was careful, look, this is how I see it. It just, you know, China is actually hurting and we hopefully can can discuss that a little bit more because I think that's something that probably not that many really understand well um, how the value chain lines up for for that commodity in China. Then um, um, they took false signals also there, um, and um, and then uh, you know about two weeks later, as as <laughs> as the hype got more, um, I said, look, uh, this is this is really the wrong time to be on copper. And then I think I sent one tweet out finally where I said, look, it's, it's a total joke. Avoid it here. It's just not going to happen. Right? It's going to fall down behind. And, uh, and that turned out to be right. And, you know, maybe it spikes one more time. You never know. But, you know, in an inflationary, you know, I over time I also learned to respect macro. Macro can make markets, right? And, and so we have to be... I can be bottom up as much as I want. If I get the macro wrong on a quarter, you know, it, prices move against you. And uh, we had an inflationary uh, quarter in in Q2, in Q2 mostly, and that certainly helped. And, and and I think the data on the macro side that comes in is also now helping copper. So, so that comes together. Um, but but in general, um, people just cannot get ahead on commodities. When it comes to um, demand and supply, you cannot. You have to stay in the present as much discipline as it takes and as much as your mind may be already embraced what is to come in the green shift or not. Let's break that down a little bit, supply and demand. I find it hugely interesting that you you looked at every single copper mine in the world. Like number one question, of course, is a how many copper mines are there? Because people yeah, are always okay. confused. It's like when Grassberg shut, or not Grassberg, sorry, a copper Panama shut down. The world was in turmoil. Or when BHP made the bid for Anglo, the copper price uh, price spike because it shone a light on the on the weak supply side. Um, let, let's break that down a little bit. I'm curious, like, what do you forecast there? And uh, you, you said uh, supply side might be starting to hurt or come down in 20, uh, 2027, 2028. Just, just, let's, let's get just a tad more granular. I'm just curious. That's almost personal curiosity more than anything else. We can do that. Um, like we don't have to break it down mine by mine, obviously, but I'm curious. Like, yeah, we don't. I also, frankly, don't. 
um, I'm not so keen to share some of that knowledge. Um, <laughs> I, I, my next thing, question or complaint was to be is like, you got to share that research with the world on Twitter, because I'm curious uh, to, to, to see that, of course, but maybe we can break By that way, down. I, like... I think I'm one of those that are generous with my research. I mean, <laughs> I, I send out in 2021, people will find my COPPO thesis long in between. I was very loud about this is a great time for COPPO right now here. Uh, and so hopefully people appreciate that doesn't mean that that doesn't make me always right. But I think some of the big moves, either in oil or in gas or in copper uh, or in gold, I think I got pretty right. And um, look, uh, rather than going mind by mind, and, you know, if you really want to know, no, like, where do you see some disruption and, coming and, from? And I show you some of, of our work, but but it just takes a long time to get a copper mine on. on, on mine, right? I mean, realistically, 20 years. And I think that's even not bad. You know, it might as well take 30 years. Every interesting copper deposit is at the wrong place. And that is not the criticism of jurisdictions, although those are difficult too. But, you know, what Filio Mining, uh, Jose Maria, um, uh, um, the interesting um, copper exploration projects or, or future copper mine projects of the Lundin family, you know, they are at 6,000 meters in the uh, uh, in Latin America, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Argentina or Chile. Um, now go and uh, mine every day on 6,000 meters. Okay, so you need to bring up the infrastructure, the streets, the water, uh, uh, you know, all the facilities and so on, you know, it's a huge challenge. Okay, then there is, I'll give you another one. There is Udo Khan in Russia, a fantastic deposit. It's gonna have a ton of copper. It's in the middle of nowhere, flies are this big there in the summer. In the winter, it's minus 40 degrees. And in between there is zero road. So if you only as a tourist decide, okay, look, I'm, I'm close with whatever, you know, uh, Usmanov who, who runs this project um, uh, and I get a special invitation because he's so, you know, fond of, of the knowledge we have in this industry and then you go there. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally an adventure and, and I tell me, I, I, believe me, I was in places, right, in, in Peru, in the, in the Amazonian, um, you know, the piranhas were next little boat here and so so. I, I'm happy to, to go on an adventure, but it's just awkward. Okay. And then to make an industrial scale project out of these, A, always takes longer. B, um, it's hard to do just in general, engineering ones, right? To get the electricity in, to get the water in, to get the roads in, to get the transportation and exits in, and so on. So, number two. Number three, if it's in Russia, you know, everyone wants to understand who gets what. Right. So that's awkward. Um, it's highly corrupt, right, uh, since Putin is in. Um, okay, so uh, uh, now you can say, okay, let's do Mongolia. It's fantastic, right? And there is this wonderful underground mine and so on. And then you look at the Rio Tinto project. By the way, Friedland discovered that, um, um, that mine in, in Mongolia. And then, um, you know, since then Rio Tinto owns um, most, if not all of it. Um, if you look at that, I mean, it, it's just engineering-wise hard. Hmm. And then the rules get nevertheless changed. Maybe they uh, they weren't quite, um, you know, call it Rio Tinto was, was negotiating maybe a little hard on Mongolia, but fair enough. And then as you move 20 years into the projects, you get the hard things done, you know, they change the rule on you. And so... You know, it's just hard. Everything about mining is hard. And even if you're in Canada or the, well, let's talk about the US, by the way, right? There are, you know, there is the petal project in Alaska that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't get approved, right? Under the Biden green president, right? Just doesn't get approved. It, it would be an no-brainer project in my view, right? Some, you know, Holy Lake uh, uh, makes it impossible to, to approve or, or some local interest. Rosemont, you know, Arizona is a man. You don't get anything down there. You think in America, you know, the 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 the, 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 the capital of capitalism in the world, you know, has a has a balance on these projects. And and yes, they agree on the green shift. And yes, we want it. We need more metals. 
for um, for the electrification of everything, and yet you don't make you know, not in my backyard, huh? mm. not in my. It's fine to have it in wherever Congo, um, and but not here. So you have to go to these dodgy places, and um, dodgy because they don't have the rule of law. You know, sorry for mm. those that listen and think no, but we are much better. You know, it's just it's 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 a mess, and. Um, and so you nevertheless have, as, a, as entrepreneurs, you, don't, you, you only have bad choices on the menu. And so you have to pick the, call it the best reservoir with the least amount of burdens, um, either above or below ground. Um, so politically or, or, you know, from an engineering perspective, and you solve those problems. And that, those, by definition, take a lot of capital and they take a lot of time. And um, and they are very uncertain on the path from A to Z. So that's the problem about the supply side without going mine by mine. And then if Mr. Friedland with his Chinese partners get something done like as he did in uh, in in Congo, um, I t- I tip my head because you know it, it it's huge, it matters, it's uh, it's fantastic, it's uh, it's amazing, and and not many can get it done. But just to and summarize, then maybe this... the way, try on the way, right? And, and and just don't get that. That's another aspect. I mean, you know, the, 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 the mines that move the needle on a call it 24 million ton uh, um, 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 uh, copper mining market, you know, there are 10 companies, or maybe, you know, there could be 30, but they, but they don't participate. Could Volkswagen, you know, become a party to the, these difficult points. Absolutely, they could, but they don't, right? Um, the Quant family in Germany, absolutely could they. Yes, they should probably, but they don't participate, right? And so you're left always with the, you know, a, a, a few Chinese guys, companies, then you're left with um, the, the usual subject, subjects on the West. So people make that, that, that is a very people. interesting topic because yeah. Stellantis, for example, invested in McEwen Copper. Right. Well, of course, uh, good. That's the right way, right? Uh, I'm aware of that. But what I'm saying is, you need a lot of that to 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 kind of de-risk that sector and have a have a chance to actually have the copper um, uh, supply increase the way it's it's um, you know the the way the demand side is advertised. Mm-hmm. No, but to, maybe to summarize, on the supply side, you don't see like all big mines going offline. It's more that there's not enough new supply coming on stream. Is that correct? Right. The, the best mines, the best mines are getting old, <laughs> and um, you know whatever Codelco has is really getting old, and was by the way discovered a hundred years ago by uh, American engineers. <laughs> and at some point, um, you know, they degrade in in ways that it really starts to hurt the, the supply side. And, uh, at the degrading of, of copper, also the degrading of concentrate of copper is a huge um, factor um, in on the supply side. Okay. So more tons, more more dirt has to be moved to get for, to just to stay still. That's a fact of the of, of life. And at the same time, you know, uh, if you if you pay attention to the entire Latin American patch, right? Peru had a very difficult patch for a moment, which you know is the second most important copper producer in the world after Chile. Had a very difficult political patch, which I was in the middle of it with my petrol investment. Right? So that, that was all good. Right? Chile, at the next moment, also uh votes in uh, um, a government where you didn't know what it means for taxes and and, and therefore entrepreneurs hold back on, on new investments because they say look <laughs> tell me uh, what my taxes are in the next uh, 20 years and um i tell you what i what i'm going to invest in your country so expansion brownfield expansion at the moment is is not doing much and it could do a lot now it's interesting that we have Millet in Argentina. Uh, I think he, he's he's much 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 more interesting personality than most people understand. I think he, there are misunderstandings here in the West what, what what the guy is capable of. So I have high hopes for him, but he has a monumental task at hand to fix that country. But um, if you are like the Lundin family, uh, you know, um, uh, positioned in Argentina with two very very interesting uh, deposits. Um, that is very, very interesting right now. No. Uh, I, I urge everybody to watch the interview I've done with Rob um, McEwen. Um, Ecuador, super difficult, right? So the entire 
Latin, where the copper is, it gets more difficult politically at the moment. So that, it's just difficult, the supply side. Just just on Millet real quick, I interviewed Rob McEwen the other day when I was in New York and uh, he, he met with Millet and uh, he, he mentioned that he's, he's attacking the right things like uh, foreign currency exports and things like that. So he, he's attacking it the right way. I urge everybody to watch that interview. Um, but I think that's put a bow around the supply side. I think we need to talk demand. And I think that is really interesting because everybody talks about electrification. And I also like we talk a lot about the economy here on our channel, of course, and recession fears, not just in the US, but globally. And uh, you, you brought up China and you were hoping that we we're going to talk about uh, the Chinese economy here a little bit. And we should because it is still you know one of the demand drivers in the commodity space so let, let, let's talk about it let, let's talk about the demand side uh, let's talk about china let's talk about recession fears in china and maybe uh you know depression fears in china where, where are your thoughts on that alexander <laughs> <laughs> china so again it uses 50 percent of copper that doesn't mean that every washing machine that is produced in china stays in china but, but at least it gets um you know, um, manufactured in China. Okay. Mm. China is in a very difficult place because of this property crisis. The property crisis, in my view, is while well advertised in headlines, is still by very few properly understood how severe it is and how difficult to solve it is. In my view, the times of grand construction as they had in the last 30 years, like no other country ever had before, either for infrastructure or for property, also for housing, has been um, second to none and probably will never be repeat or, you know, we can almost, uh, you know, confirm it will never be repeated again. Now, the problem is China is, and now came COVID, came a combination of overheating in that market, over speculation, too much price increases, huge quality problems, a lot of started but not completed projects a lot of fraud, um, a lot of second and third home ownership just for the sake of ownership because Tina, it was the, there is no alternative, it was the only place to kind of have a store of value. And this entire combination with, so in, in this entire combination came COVID and came what I would call overheating rules by the Chinese government, so the three um, red lines, and suddenly confidence broke. And this entire, um, call it almost Ponzi-like <laughs> financing structure, that circle broke. And um, I think it, it, it at, the, at this stage, even though they've announced a lot in the last couple of weeks, I think it will need a lot more just to stabilize this market or this market will go weaker and weaker and weaker by the week. I mean, you know, 10, 15, 20% weaker, no problem. By the week, by the month. So it's in a very critical stage. So why does that matter? Because construction and real estate have probably used 70% of what copper was used for in China. Now, um, despite many housing starts, which is, by the way, the wrong metric to look at, um, you have to look at housing completions because many, many houses have been started but not complete and therefore never fully wired. Or, or you, know, um, you know, all the piping and so on has not, has not even been done. But in general, it doesn't I don't see necessarily the big weakness coming from housing completion, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive for, for some of your guests, but they should pay close attention to starts, the difference between housing starts and housing completion in China. 
And the key metric to watch there is housing completion. And that doesn't necessarily have to come off a cliff. And simply because the, uh, a Chinese home buyer has to come up with the, you know, in the pre-sales uh, a system that China has, has to come up with 100% of the money on day one. And then, you know, usually waits one, say two to three years before his house gets delivered. But a lot of that has not been delivered. And the three red lines, have weakened developers so much that even less is delivered now. So there is the weakness there. The completion is actually suffering, not so much because the policy wants it to suffer. The policy actually wants to achieve the contrary. It wants actually the developers to complete and stop to speculate on land or other things or simply walk away with the money. A lot of fraud was there too. But the main weakness now comes also in... Um, you know, the weakness created in the in the property sector that now needs so much central government help. And that actually uh, uh, means that developers can now not buy all the what is called land concessions or land right use, which made up 36 percent of um, local government financing. So it's a massive thing, mainly means that local governments are bankrupt. Sorry mm -hmm. to say it's so blunt. But that's exactly what it is. They don't know how to finance the future. So the central government now has a ton of liabilities coming its way, and they already know. And it, you know, they, they try to keep the house together. But what it means is that the big infrastructure projects are off the table, right? I mean, <laughs> no one has time to, to build a road through the middle of nowhere at the moment, or has the money, or has the financing for it, even if they have to keep factories. So that's number one aspect that everyone should carefully digest and carefully look into the details and not just be up in the sky and say, oh, China is maybe not as weak as I thought and so on. So number one. Number two, what that all means is that the Chinese, you know, planning economy, centrally, central planning economy driven model wants everything else given this mess, which was about 25% of economic activity, wants everything else to function. So that creates a lot of awkward false signals. One of them, for instance, is that the Chinese copper smelters have a mandate to function, number one. So, you know, get, get the concentrate, smelt it, and turn it into a copper cathode. Just do it. You have your capacity, function, work. Number two, they even have a movement to increase capacity by another 10 to 15 percent in the next 12 months. Now, the problem is the world doesn't need that smelting capacity. It has already too much. China alone, leave alone all the rest of the world. That's why uh, treatment charges have totally collapsed to zero. As there isn't enough concentrate for the Chinese to compete even more. And now some in the market take that as a bullish signal, hey, because this is, there is all this concentrate demand, when actually it has nothing to do with end user demand. They just have to keep the oven hot. Now you can call, you can argue and say, yeah, but it's demand. That's correct. And then the, the, the inventory uh, just continued to increase and increase and increase and it has nothing to do with the wars, you know, the Twitter, you know, a few half smart, you know, geopolitical, whatever guys that have zero uh, detail on commodities now reads, read something like, oh, there is war paper. It has nothing to do with war paper. It has just to do with everyone has, to, has now a mandate to keep the oven hot. Or even, you know, if you are one of, the, one of the pieces in our economy that is still functioning, perform. Because the, the, the last they need at the moment uh, in their central bureau is, is for others to, uh, other dominoes to fall to. So that's the problem um, reading commodity demand out of China, is that there is a lot of false signaling weak uh, um, uh, treatment charges is not a sign of strength and a lot of demand and user demand. It's a sign of overcapacity, having to find the last bit of concentrate and then having no margin left for each of them, then even building more capacity, then the problem gets even, even more severe. And then um, um, once they smelt it um, on the other side, consumers 
or I shouldn't say consumers, I should say whatever factory, electronical factory, pipe maker, whatever, is super price sensitive. And as the Western market bids up the price, they just, they don't buy anymore. They just say, look, A, I have an off in my store, uh, in my in my inventory, you know, of semi-finished products. B, you know, uh, uh, the end consumer side, you know, new washing machines and so on, due to the property market, again, is not, is not coming. Right? I mean, there, there is, I mean, it's going down for sure. It's not completely falling off a cliff, but there is just less demand. So, okay, let's try to export more, but there comes the, come the tariffs uh, from, from the US, from Europe and so on, because everyone knows China is over capacity. And so they want to protect their own consumers and markets and, and producers from, from price dumping. And, um, and so that's the, the story of China. And, and so you can have a, an, a short period of full signals where actually concentrate gets speed up or at least gets immediately taken off the market as there is, is, is any capacity, right? At the same time, actually, it has absolutely nothing to do with strong demand behind the criminal um, um, in, the, in the Chinese system, where actually the, the, the demand data are horrible. Um, just weak, weaker and weaker, uh, despite a centrally planned economy, which, you know, maybe the oven is warm, but you cannot force the consumer now to buy an additional washing machine or a second EV if they don't need it. And by the way, have that up to tilt, right? They are now at 66% household debt. In China, it's at 66% of GDP. That's the highest number. A, a it's peak number. B, it's, you know, it was only, what, 40% uh, three years ago. So and twenty percent uh, six years ago. So 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 it's really bad, right? Everyone is is leveraged. The system is leveraged. The central government is leveraged. There is a lot of debt in the entire system. So all system debt is high. It's about three hundred fifty percent to GDP. If you really break out properly the government debt in China and allocate where there is an implicit or explicit a government guarantee in that system. Um, and therefore, uh, the go it's actually government that, and not, you know, what the what the what what the, the people in China or the National Bureau of Statistics in China likes to call it. Then you also get to 130 percent debt to GDP. So in an emerging market context, that's twice as high as the next one. Right? I mean, India has about 42 percent, and the, and the, you know, Mexico 50, or and so, so they're completely out of whack. Right? I mean, China is still a very, you know, second largest economy, yes, but it's a 12,000 dollar per capita GDP. That's Mickey Mouse. Hmm. Mickey Mouse. Switzerland is 100,000, America 84,000. You know, the average of Europe, including the entire Eastern European part, which is still growing and slowing, you know, and 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 and, and has its issues. It's uh, 44,000. I mean, it, it's still a very, you know, fragile thing. Investment-driven economy that, that, that now is fiscally constrained to support other sectors. And I think people really want to look very closely at this China beast to stop reading headlines and to understand when someone announces in Bloomberg or in, uh, you know, anywhere in the news, oh, you know, the CCP announced a program of 500 billion Juan uh, stimulus. And I'm thinking like, you know, send me an email when they change the mortgage system. So because in the, you know, in China, if you buy a, a house on day one pre-sale, you know, you finance, usually you make a down payment, you have to make 30%, most make 60%, the rest comes in with a mortgage, but you, now you pay your mortgage. You have to service your mortgage. By the way, full recourse, right? The, the Chinese, they have you at the ball, sorry for your audience, but that's what they do, right? They can, they can punish you in all sorts of ways if you don't service that debt, that, 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 that. and yet the, the only thing China currently has is mortgage boycotts. If the Chinese would be have would they have a free media landscape, that's all we would see. Hmm. Right? And why do they have mortgage boycotts? Because the, they killed with their three lines the developers hmm. that now cannot deliver the house, and the other guys have to pay mortgage and, and have absolutely no idea when the timeline is for the house or if there is even a timeline for the house. Hmm. In fact, China, according to our calculation, has about and now listen to that number, <laughs> 120 million units 
of uncompleted housing over the last 20 years. Now, half it because uh, let's call a lot is sunk cost done deal, right? Never going to come fraud or whatever, or, you know, bankrupt uh, developers. They have 100,000 developers, not just the 20 best that Bloomberg talks about. But if you now uh, uh, take a step forward and say, okay, let's just look at the last six years, it's still, call it, uh, you know, two Germanys that have been sold, started, then stopped, and therefore uncompleted between, say, two years up to six years, and no one cares. <laughs> no one comes to rescue you, and you pay your mortgage. Now, talking about issues, right? It was the consumer that kept this house of cards together. It was the consumer that gave that fully paid price to the developer that again bought the land from the local government, which was in a total for the last 20 years, 36% of total government revenue. Hmm. And that thing has now come to an end. I think, look, what I'm telling you is most people have no clue how critical um, uh, this entire situation in China is. And they should carefully look at it because, you know, they call it the headline noise that is, you know, the, the frontline uh, Potemkin uh, number uh, village that comes out of the National Bureau of Statistics is actually just not telling you the story. But it's not difficult to get the story. You just have to focus carefully on it. Why do we do it? <laughs> because we like commodities and I just want to understand it. I don't want to get my head ripped off by being, oh, you know, green, shift you the hui and there comes, uh, you know, the uh, double demand and no supply teetotal, right? And then I just don't understand that China is currently freeing up three tons or five tons of copper um, um, in the next three to four years. Um, that first has to be absorbed by, um, you know, in a long term process by EVs and wind farms and uh, Titato. And by the way, no. don't get me wrong, our paper, um, I, I'm happy to share it with you, you know, that it explains um, how uh, copper intensive these industries are or should be. And, and yes, there is a substitution effect that will come in and so, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I love the long term prospect, but I hate the next three years that is ahead of us. While while I don't know, while we all have to learn how the CCP is is kind of stabilizing this process that is unfolding right now, and that is accelerating and then slowing down, and and where they are fiscally so constrained that they simply don't move. They they are like uh, the the mouse in in front of the of the um, of the snake. They are literally frozen. Pay attention to what they do. If if you really know how to read. Um, uh, that the entire picture, you're amazed that you know, I'm, I, I'm puzzled that there is not the bazooka coming out where they say, by the way, what the heck are you talking? Yes, this is a problem. First of all, let's let's um, let's reform our mortgage system. Uh, from now on, it's a 20% down payment, not 100%. No one pays a, 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 a needs a mortgage on day one. When the house is completed, here is you, you, you deliver your mortgage, just like everyone in the, in the rest of the world. And I say, well, now they've done something that actually could change confidence in the consumer mind, that actually could stabilize that market and actually bring activity back. Because so far, the consumer paid everything, right? It was a free financing of governments by consumers. The savers, the hardworking, average, very talented Chinese people that I admire so much. But the central planning government really, um, um, poof. Yeah. Not my Alexander, let me jump in here and uh, I have one follow up question because you had already answered the substitution part, which I had written down. Um, but we, we, we're actually running out of time. We can't get into too much detail oh, about yeah. the substitution part. But uh, one, one quick follow up here, and that is the Evergrande debacle. Personally, I thought that would be maybe the wind or the, you know, the, the last blow that would bring the house of cards down. Uh, and it hasn't. Um, 300 billion debacle. Right. And a lot of like sovereign debt. It was a lot of like international lenders that lost money in it. Why, why didn't that spiral out of control? Because China controls the banks, controls the debt system in a call it closed system, not in an open system like the West, right? Where banks are on their own. And then JP Morgan has to come out and say, look, we have to restructure and we need to refinance. And this is the, this is where we are. 
and so they can um um you know pretend that the um you know the, the most of the debt that is out there is actually uh, just fine and um don't declare it as um defaulted or, or in 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 distress and um and so they can kind of keep that system together but i wouldn't say the system is not on the full stress because it is because the system as i hopefully just explained lived from the chinese consumer not from the chinese government being able to just issue more debt and more debt and more debt no, fair enough. I appreciate that. But uh, China's a great segue as well, because we need to talk gold. And we've seen the power oh, I... of the Chinese central bank on the gold price just this past Friday. And uh, as we're recording, like gold, gold was hammered down. Of course, we've seen a massively uh, positive uh, jobs report out of the US. But then China same day announced that they didn't buy any gold in, in May. And that sent gold down quite a bit. Uh, I think it was three and a half percent. We just took back the 2300 level here as we speak, uh, Alexander. Um, let's talk about gold and the power of Asia and China in particular in, in, in the gold market right now. You talked about the arbitrage of copper, like selling into the West, but now the West is selling gold and precious metals to the East. So it's going the other way. It's the exactly opposite picture we were seeing in precious metals. Explain those dynamics a little bit. And where do you yeah. see the gold price going? Great question. So I think, so the way I look, I, I try to, to, to skin the cat is to say, so what commodity is actually neutral or positively affected by what is going on in China in the largest extent? And interestingly, there are two. One is uranium, because China is the one country that really goes serious about expanding its, um, its capacities on the energy side, uh, on, on nuclear energy side. And you know, where they have a tough time or a less tough time, they're going to make sure that those, that darling industry is taken care of and, and can expand. So uranium demand will be supported by China. Okay. The other real, one real quick, cool. Alexander, where, where's China getting its uranium from? Well, the, the, you know, of, of course, other than um, Uzbekistan, Russia, um, but, um, 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 there is. Let's focus on uranium on a on a different show because yeah, I, yeah, I really it's, it's like two. That's a different rabbit time. hole. Let's do part it, it, two it, then. It, it takes a bit of time to explain this. Gotcha. Okay. Now, let's look at gold. So, I said that property for twenty years was the darling investment of the Chinese consumer. It actually makes up seventy percent of their wealth. Property prices only went up with very few little ditches, glitches in the in the matrix. And, and otherwise, property was just one big success story for a Chinese investor for 20 years. Stopped in, 20, in June 2021. And since then, it's different. <clears throat> what that meant is that, um, and, and then China has capital control, so they couldn't do much about. Now, of course, the big, sophisticated Chinese investors have ways to uh, allocate capital abroad, but your average household has not. So the capital controls are, are rather efficient. Then uh, three, the Chinese, Chinese has, uh, has low interest rates. At the moment, the tenure is at what around 2.4%. Um, um, the, the policy rate is, is, is a little bit higher, uh, but what I'm trying to say is the bond market is not, is, is not going to, to uh, secure your future uh, in, a, in a system that has very weak um, uh, social security. Now, um, the last element um, in, <coughs> in, uh, in the puzzle was the stock market. And the stock market, as you know, has under Xi suffered. Um, uh, he came in on different industries and, and, uh, uh, and the biggest um, interference was on the tech industry where uh, they came up with very uh, dodgy explanations why, why they need, um, um, you know, regulation and, 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 and more control. And that was actually the one big horse they had in the race that uh, could, could win a lot of races. And, and, and they killed that in uh, just, you know, on the side in 2021. So, so that was very frustrating. So now what do you do as a Chinese consumer? And the answer is you have a very, very efficiently set up gold market, which is called the Shanghai Gold Exchange. 
which is a regulated entity that was set up, I don't know, 2004, um, in order to avoid fraud and to have a very regulated market, and they did that beautifully. And now listen to that one. Over that period to, the, to this date, Chinese consumers accumulate about 25 million tons. For perspective, the US Federal Reserve has 8.8, .8, so 8,800 tons. The Chinese have 25,000. Um, I'm talking to Chinese retail consumer, right? So, so there is an element of culture there, there is an element of understanding, you know, there is this, all these, these jewelry things and so that they like, but also they, you know, they buy the bars, the coins, the, and, and simple investment purposes. Okay, so for us, it's an incredibly important market to understand. And actually, since the housing crisis, it became more important because the numbers that come in, we can measure these things over the cost and data that they import, which is so gold imports explode. And the cost and data reports what goes into the Shanghai Gold Exchange and into the, call it the wholesale system or the retail system of China. It has nothing to do with what the central bank does, that uh, they do that to our understanding and knowledge, they do that off the book. By the way, if people say, well, they haven't bought, they haven't announced more, more purchases, that's uh, not an information you can take at face value because uh, in our view, the Chinese bought, um, the Chinese central bank bought more gold than they have, but there is no point in us discussing it here in public uh, on things that, that are a little bit complicated to explain why it has to be that way when you look at the World Gold Council uh, reports and, uh, and where the gap is. And then some can still argue, oh, maybe, you know, it was more Russia or more this or that central bank that actually doesn't show the reserve. But anyway, there is a gap that needs to be explained and that is likely the Chinese and to some extent the Russian central banks that, that have those reserves. But if we leave all that aside, the Chinese wholesale market is, in my view, the element that is least understood and most under discussed in, in the gold market since it has this link from the real rates in the United States, more or less in, um, you know, in the summer of 2020, where we actually started to tweet about it and say, oh, that's interesting what's going on. And then uh, most pundits again, oh, it's the central banks buying more, you know, it's this geopolitical element, it's the, the dislink between, you know, the dollar and uh, what the East wants and so on. And, and some of that is actually, is actually correct. What it leaves out is this entire element of the property market collapsing, then Tino, there was no alternative, and now what do you do in order to save? and to have an asset that actually goes up when you cannot uh, invest abroad. And I'm talking again about the masses. You know, there's no point in someone explaining me there are 500 rich guys that can bring the money elsewhere. It's no problem. <laughs> I have to say that. Who cares about those 500? You know, what they buy, um, uh, the property market, what they bought on an annual basis was in the trillions per year, dollars. And now they have this little thing called gold market where, you know, they buy about two, three hundred billion a year. And actually, if the masses really start to learn more and more about it, and the gold exchange, the Shanghai gold exchange has been set up to make it convenient for you and me to understand how you do it. And it's easy and there is an app and there is this and there is that. So it's really made to to attract a, a new retail and new clients and, and new professionals and so on. And, and if they continue that growth path, I'm getting very optimistic on gold. And it's mainly that element that makes us study so carefully what's going on on the property side, on the entire system side. And um, uh, because A, it helps us to understand copper, it helps us to understand oil, gas, LNG, it helps us to understand the cold side, it, the uranium side, but it certainly helps us now to understand the gold side, which is fantastic. That's the last kind of puzzle that we missed. I mean, silver is also very important because uh, uh, the solar uh, side is, is a big growth market for silver. So it just is important to understand the Chinese puzzle. And for gold, it, I, I think it's, it's the most under-discussed under part. And that's why we uh, track it very closely. And, and it makes me optimistic now. Is macro and the West 
does it not matter anymore at all? Of course it matters at, at you know, individual moments, times, maybe Friday was one of them. But um, I think if more important for us is to understand is the Chinese consumer continue that path of buying more gold. And I think for now, I, the only evidence I have is yes. And now people say maybe the currency uh, will be devalued a little bit to, to support exports. And I say, well, then they're even going to buy more. Right? That's, mm -hmm. that's their inflation hedge. Then what else can they do? So we, we need kind of a system breakdown in China where I get bearish. The Chinese retail consumer now trying to hedge himself a bit more with gold. Mm -hmm. And I'm not yet at the full, you know, this is a process also for us where we constantly learn and observe and see and try to understand reality and not just talk up in the clouds and, and not get stuck in our own little theory. But for now, it really looks interesting. And the last 12 months have certainly proven so. At the same time, Kai, uh, the miners don't, don't, uh, you know, price as if, if as if gold is 1600, 1500. Yes, there is a bit of cost inflation, but even if you adjust for that, it doesn't justify. And if you do a proper DCF as we do, many of these miners are just dirt cheap. Yeah. And 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 then you don't even have to go for the for the wild ones, the little ones, the explorer ones. You just go for the high quality ones, and they to me look cheap. And if they start to produce their cash flow on the basis of current prices. And to finally maybe buy back shares and finally become more shareholder friendly, then um, I think that's an interesting place to be. That leads me to the last question, Alexander. Is really is like how do you play the gold, the, the assumed gold rally or the gold price appreciation rally that that you sort of predict here? Like how how are you playing it? Are you buying physical? Are you buying ETFs, stocks? Like what, what's your portfolio composition? What are you looking yeah. at? Let me just clarify to make sure that no one then later on comes, oh, you know, he was bullish and then it went down for 10 percent. So I, I'm not very good in predicting the next two months um, or based on macro. Now, I, I pay close attention to macro. Yes, I think we're better in it than we were maybe 10 years ago. But, you know, I don't feel comfortable to say exactly, you know, these are the main forces that trigger right now this or that. But if you ask me, what should I do? with an outlook of 12 to months to, to 24 months and allow me to change my mind if, if the effects on the ground change. But Ceteris Paribus, if everything stays as it is now, I think over two years you get rewarded being long quality miners. Fantastic. Precious metals uh, miners, Sorry, let me be clear, gold miners. Yeah. All right, Alexander, we, we have to put a bow around this and then uh, this might actually be the longest episode we've ever recorded in sort of financially it. history and I tremendously appreciate it and enjoyed it. So that's why I let it go and uh, your your explanations were fantastic and spot on and uh, really, really appreciate your time. Like, where can we follow your work, Alexander? Where, how do we get best a hold of you? Well, uh, now that we spoke, I, please feel free to, to reach out. Uh, it was a pleasure and it's an honor to be on your show too. Hopefully we can repeat it at some point and pick a specific topic together and say, let, let's drill in. Two, um, um, we don't publish that much, but from time to time we publish something of our research where we think, look, maybe others are interested in it. And um, um, so, so that's two. And then three, I'm on Twitter under uh, Burggraben H. Um, uh, that's my Twitter handle, and maybe you can um, um, publish it in on your. We will website. link it down below, link absolutely, it so that people can follow us. We have phases where I I have more to say, and then I have phases where uh, you know I like to say I'm smart in pockets, right? And if if you know, often for me the market is as confusing as for anyone else, despite being in it for a long time. And sometimes I I find that that kind of what is ahead of me very i see very clearly and i find it easy and then i even have a big mouth <laughs> and ne never take it t too seriously i don't certainly take myself too seriously even though i can be you know this or that um, you know i'm 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 happy to 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 take my lessons even at 53 but um uh, that's the way fantastic alexander we'll definitely have to go for a beer when i'm down in zurich or zook next oh, time so awesome. We would love that. Thank you so much for your time. It was tremendously appreciated. Definitely looking forward to part two of this because we have to talk uranium, which we had to skip over this time. So yeah. we'll have to throw that into part two of the conversation. And everybody else, if you want to see or listen to part two, 
Give us a like, give us a thumbs up. Let us know that we had the right guest on here and uh, leave, leave a comment. If we do want to hear from you, it's tremendously appreciated. If you haven't done so, kindly hit that subscribe button and uh, share it with like-minded investors and friends. We tremendously appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for tuning in here, Soar Financially. We'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you.